So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Johnny Go. I've been requested to uh, give the first session, which is an introductory session on basic critical realism. But before that, it might be good for us to just say hello to our online participants because there are online participants. So, so it's a little bit uh, trickier today because we're doing hybrid. Uh, Okay, so the, the first talk has been called The Four Essential Insights of Original Critical Realism. There have been several incarnations, as Doug said. So I'm going to focus on the most basic one, which is what I, I studied for. I continue to be a student of critical realism, so I'm looking forward to the exchange that will happen here and also online, so we can learn from one another. No? So for me, as I was studying critical realism about a decade ago, um, I felt that four insights of critical realism define critical realism. And I'm hoping that this take on critical realism will help you appreciate and understand crit critical realism as well, at least original critical realism. So before we begin, maybe just a survey of the room and maybe the online participants. Um, some of you may be looking for an introduction to critical realism. Others may be looking for clarifications on certain concepts of critical realism while others are seeking how to better apply critical realism. So can you just choose a caller, just get a survey from of the room. How many of you are below to the blue box? Okay. Uh, how many for red? The, red, the red box and the green box? Okay, so those who choose the green box, the entire conference is very suitable for you. you know? <laughs> but for this talk, it's really basically for the blue and the red boxes. But even if you're you know, looking out for applications, it doesn't hurt to get a review, right? Because as we know, critical realism is quite complex and, and not very easy reading, okay? So, um, so Roy, I'm, I'm going to focus on Roy Basker's book uh, called A Realist Theory of Science, which was published in 1975. I was a doctoral student under Roy uh, back in 2014, I think. And um, so it was a great privilege to study with him. And it was very helpful because he could explain what he was writing in his books. Because as you know, um, the writing of Roy isn't exactly uh, literary. You know, it's not exactly easy reading, right? Uh, so yeah. Um, so basically this book is on a philosophy of the physical sciences. Now, later on uh, this morning, Doug will speak about the philosophy of the social sciences, focusing on uh, the possibility of naturalism, the, the book of, Roy Bastar on the social sciences. But I will focus on the physical sciences, which basically will talk about our underlying assumptions about doing science. So the main project of Roy at that time was, we all believe in the sciences, we believe in the physical sciences, no? but what are the assumptions that are underlying the enterprise of the physical science? It's good to be ex uh, explicit about them so we can be clearer about what these assumptions are. At the same time, according to Roy, if you look at the, uh, if we take into consideration these assumptions about doing science, you cannot help but talk about your assum our assumptions about the world that the sciences investigate, right? So while his project originally was about the physical sciences, I'd like to propose to you that for me in my own work, I've seen that these assumptions about the sciences also apply to human knowing in general, no? And the assumptions about the world that science investigates can also be sort of extrapolated with certain qualifications to reality in general. Okay, so this is one reason why I find critical realism, original critical realism, very powerful. I feel that although it has clarified a lot of things about the physical and the social sciences, it has also helped me um, talk about human knowing in general and about other realities in general. The principles sort of apply, you no? Know? To, cert to a certain extent, okay? Um, so my talk will focus on what I call, the, what I consider the four essential insights about reality that uh, critical, that, that original critical realism has been able to surface, no? And each one is a mouthful, no? Intransitivity, stratification, open system emergence, no? Uh, these jargons are inevitable because they are summaries of, uh, you know, concepts and theories. So it's important for us to at least be acquainted with them, no? So I will talk about the four insights as best as I can, given the, the, the time limit that I have. But at the same time, I will also begin to touch on the critiques about ways of thinking that these four insights sort of uh, make us consider. You know? What are these ways of thinking? They would be relativism, positivism, 
determinism, and reductionism. So my, my main thesis is that the four essential insights of original critical realism really help critique these prevalent, or they used to be prevalent anyway, ways of thinking, relativism, positivism, determinism, and reductionism. So I'm hoping that as I go through the talk, you'll be able to formulate your own questions and your own insights as well, and we can listen to them, okay? So this will be a snapshot of what the talk is about. So I'll try my best to, to, to be coherent during the talk and to, to try not to bore you out of your wits, okay? So, so one of the big ideas of Roy uh, that really attracted me is his critique of modern philosophy when it had this sort of commandment that thou shalt not commit ontology. The modern philosophers were allergic to ontology. They were allergic to talking about reality because it's not easy to do that. You know? So as, as many of you know, what happened in modern philosophy is that there was um, a detour to epistemology. You know? Whereas the pre-moderns, the ancients and the medievals were very comfortable talking about metaphysics. The modern philosophers beginning with Descartes, the very doubtful Descartes said, let's just stick to epistemology because at least we know what, we're, uh, you know, we, we know what knowing is about. Reality, we don't know. So there was a sort of obsession with epistemology and there was an allergy to ontology. And what Roy Basker is saying is that you can't help but do ontology. Whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, we always have an implicit ontology. You know? In short, whether you're aware of it or not, you have assumptions about reality which you are allowing to shape your research, shape the way you act. So we may as well be explicit about our ontologies so that we can be consistent. You know? If our assumptions of reality are X, Y, and Z, it's important when we do research, you know, uh, our, our research project is consistent with X, Y, and Z. Okay, so and that made a lot of sense to me, I thought. So yeah, so, so let's, let's figure out what the, what the philosophy of Roy, uh, what's, what Roy's philosophy of the sciences has to tell us about reality. And these are the four essential insights, okay? So basically he begins by talking about the two main functions of the empirical and experimental sciences. Roy says, there is no denying that if you believe in science, you believe in observation or sense perception and you believe in experimental activity. So let's begin there. Let's not talk about God or the, you know, whatever else, anything nebulous out there. Let's talk about the very concrete things that scientists actually practice, that students of science actually subscribe to. We all believe in observation, sense perception. We believe in experimental activity. These are the two main functions of the physical sciences, no? the emp uh, empirical and experimental sciences. No? So the main uh, task of Roy is what he calls transcendental analysis, which is of course, uh, um, you know, it's, a, it's an allusion to Kant. However, uh, Roy was very proud that he sort of, you know, uh, put Kant upside down because while Kant uh, conducted transcendental analysis in order to make conclusions about the human mind, you know, what Roy does is he makes conclusions about the world, about reality. You know? So uh, analyzing observation, experimental activity, the question he asks, and the question we'll be trying to answer during this talk is, what should the world be like for science to be possible and intelligible? What is it about the world that makes observation, experimental activity possible? What is it about the world that makes uh, experimental activity, uh, ob uh, observation, experimental activity intelligible for it to make sense? No? So the answer to that is of course, the four essential insights about the world. No? Intransitivity, stratification, emergence, and open system. And I'll go through each one of them, okay? So let's focus on observation and sense, observe, uh, sense perception. No one's going to deny that as a scientist, it's important to observe, to use, our, to use our sense perceptions, right? So what are the conditions for the possibility and intelligibility of sense perception? If we all believe that this makes sense, what is it about the world that makes it possible and allows it to make sense, okay? So, what Roy does is he sort of focuses on our experience of fallibility and mutability in perception. All of us perceive, right? Uh, using our five or more senses. No? And, and, um, and, and we all experience fallibility and mutability. Basically, this means that we all experience changes in our perceptions. No? For example, somebody looks really good from afar and then when we get near, oops, no. <laughs> made a mistake there, <laughs> error, okay? Uh, um, we change our perception or we make a mistake, right? Uh, Good looking, not so good looking. So 
fallibility and mutability, right? Now, according to Roy, well, he didn't put it this way. This is my, more my take. He was never that like that. But, but basically what he says is that our experience of fallibility and mutability tells us something about the world. Right? And basically the term he uses is that the world is intransitive. Right? What does he mean by intransitive? I'm a grammar cop. So for me, intransitive is a grammar term, which means that you don't have a direct object if you have a verb. But he kind of appropriates the word and adds a new meaning to it because he didn't want to use the word objective because of all the baggage, the philosophical baggage with it. But basically, if you want a simple explanation, it means the world's objective. You know? uh, and, and basically, it's independent. The world is independent of the knower's perception. And it is not just a mental construction. Now, some of you may say that's kind of obvious, but uh, if you go to the history of philosophy, it's, it wasn't always that obvious. No? So, and, and the point um, Roy makes here is that the, the world being intransitive, the world being independent of um, the knower, the knower's perception and knowing, makes it possible for scientific change, for scientific development, makes it possible for scientific criticism, and makes it possible for scientific education. If the world weren't intransitive, if the world were merely a mental construction, there would be no sense in scientific change. There's nothing to change. Everyone comes up with his own world or her own world, right? There's nothing to criticize. There's no need for education. No? So um, the self-correction -correct characteristic of the empirical sciences would not make sense if the objects of their studies were merely dependent on their very processes, right? So if the world were not intransitive, that means I can make up my own world there's no need for self-correction. There's no need for scientific change or development. No? Secondly, there would be no point to science education or any scientific training if the world that, 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 that the sciences scrutinize is nothing more than its own creation. We don't need to go to school, right, uh, if that's the case. And finally, um, without an ontology, there's no criterion for the evaluation of scientific knowledge. No? There's no basis for scientific development, and there's no requirement for scientific education and training. So it's actually quite simple when you think about it, but I think Roy was able to clarify, sort of clear the ground and clarify why it makes sense for the world to be intransitive. And you're aware that there've been a lot of debates about whether the world is you know, uh, constructed and so on and so forth. Okay, so, so that's, that would be, I think, the first big conclusion or insight of critical realism that the world, that the world that science investigates is intransitive, meaning it's nowhere independent. You know? And it's, re it's relatively autonomous of science and scientists um, and relatively autonomous of human knowledge and knowers. I heard in a podcast that in NASA, the, the biggest celebration is when they prove themselves wrong. See, and, and that, that shows you that the world is intransitive, that the universe is intransitive because you get corrected by the universe, okay? But this, the flip side to the world being intransitive is that the work of science, the very enterprise of science is transitive. No? On the one hand, the world that science investigates is nowhere independent, but on the other, the very theories, the concepts, the paradigms of science, the methodologies of science are all nowhere dependent. They're transitive. That's the term he uses. No? And he talks about the social production of knowledge. So he does not deny that knowledge is a social production. No? It's very much a social enterprise. You don't a scientist never works in a vacuum, always works with what's already there, no? the body of knowledge already inherited, but builds on it, corrects it, or confirms it, and so on and so forth. So, so, um, so I think these two dimensions of uh, science uh, are a great contribution as far as original critical realism is concerned, to be able to distinguish between the, tra the transitive work of science and the intransitive world that science investigates, and to hold them in tension. So what happens really is that uh, by, by, by making this distinction between the intransitive uh, world and the transitive enterprise of science, uh, Roy sort of warns us against epistemic fallacy, what he calls the epistemic fallacy, which basically is the tendency for us to reduce reality into our knowledge of it. So in this diagram, you see the blue um, shape, no? uh, that's a rectangle, okay? So that stands for reality. And our knowledge of reality is, of course, limited. It's the red uh, square or rectangle. No? And epistemic fallacy is basically the two, conflating the two no? so that ontology is equal to epistemology. 
basically that's what happened in, in modern philosophy. No? Uh, people started ignoring ontology and said, let's just talk about epistemology. But that led to epistemic fallacy. And to see how this applies to us, I think we can use ordinary examples. So sometimes when we're in a relationship, we tend to sort of reduce the reality of the person to our knowledge of the person. That's where trouble begins, right? But let's not get into that, okay? So that shows you that uh, critical realism can be quite uh, relevant, no? Now, uh, Roy Baskar also talks about the holy trinity of critical realism. I personally don't like that term because I'm a Catholic priest, but, but uh, we can say triumvirate of critical realism where he talks about three big jargons that summarize what I just talked about. The first is judgmental rationality. Basically, the enterprise of science is a commitment to judgmental rationality. What is judgmental rationality? It's the possibility and necessity to evaluate and make judgments about different and even opposing claims about reality, right? So for example, is the earth flat or is it a sphere? There have been opposing, um, um, we were hoping that the case had been settled by now, but now we have flat earthers, right? So there are different claims about the world, about the earth, right? And about climate change and so on and so forth. Judgmental rationality is the responsibility to evaluate and make judgments about different claims. What makes that possible? What makes judgmental rationality possible is the intransitivity of the world. The fact that the world, that reality is independent of knowers makes it possible for us to make judgments about the world, to evaluate different things. And he calls that ontological realism. No? That's the, his summary, the jargon that summarizes that whole thing. However, he also says that knowledge is transitive and dependent on knowers. We know that, right? Every, every piece of knowledge, every account, every, uh, yeah, every account, every theory is culturally bound, historically bound, and for that reason, perspectival and limited. No? And he calls it epistemic relativism. I think what's important about this, uh, this particular slide is that ontological realism, the belief that the world is intransitive, makes it possible to do judgmental rationality. But epistemic relativism makes it necessary to do judgmental rationality. The fact that we have different and opposing claims, we need to exercise and practice judgmental rationality. Okay, So that's as far as uh, the holy trinity of basic crit uh, criticism is concerned. So, so basically what he does is he, he sort of condemns relativism or in Roy Baskar's term, he calls it judgmental relativism because Roy isn't denying any kind of relativism. You know? There's such a thing as epistemic relativism. Our knowledge is relative, but reality is not. You know? What Roy does, he uh, clearly um, uh, restricts relativism only to knowledge. But reality is not relative. Reality is real. No? It's a real. So he is against judgmental relativism. So one way of summarizing it, again, Roy didn't say this is just my own layman's term for it. Um, for, for basic critical, for critical realism, knowledge is a judgment. You always make a judgment. You always have to evaluate the judgment and form the judgment. Relativism, the very popular way of thinking even today, relativism, judgmental relativism, really thinks of knowledge as opinion. It's up to me. I just have to respect everyone's opinion. But if you're a critical realist, you can't do that. You can't accept that, no. You can, you can be politically correct and be diplomatic, but you can't say you agree with everyone. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't, uh, it's not compatible with uh, the first insight of critical realism, which is intransitivity, okay? So that's the first insight. I'm tired already, okay. So the first conclusion of critical realism is that observation and sense perception would be neither possible nor intelligible if the world were merely our own construction and were completely dependent on us. In short, the world must be intransitive. That's the first insight. Okay. By the way, we'll, we'll share the slides uh, after for if you want. So you don't have to, do, you don't have to copy the drawings. No? So <laughs> the second insight is more about our experience of finitude in perception. When we're perceiving things, our perceptions are limited. We can't perceive everything, no? So the second insight of Roy about reality is that reality is stratified. And what does he mean by that? He makes uh, a claim that reality has at least, uh, reality does not just have one domain, no? Which is the empirical. Usually people think there's only one empirical domain, meaning our experiences. The world is equal to our experiences, no? But that's not true. There are many events which have not been experienced, no? Um, so there must be another domain which is beyond the empirical. No? Um, 
again, to, to conflate the actual domain and the empirical domain would be committing epistemic fallacy. We are sort of you know, reducing reality or knowledge of it. No? But some events in the world have not been experienced or known, no? or possibly and in principle cannot be experienced or known. The example that comes to mind here is the black hole. The black hole cannot be, the black hole itself cannot be experienced, only the effects of the black hole. No? Uh, recently there was there were photographs of the black hole, but those photographs are actually photographs of the effects of the black hole and not the black hole. No? So there are events in the world which are real, but cannot be experienced or have not been experienced by humanity. And uh, that's something to think about because I not not everyone will agree with that. No? So do you agree with that? No, but I think if you if you feel that your perception is limited, in principle, it makes a lot of sense. No? So the second claim really is that um, by analyzing sense perception, that per sense perception and observation are limited, um, Bhaskar makes the claim that there are at least two domains in reality. The first is empirical, domain of the empirical, which means all our experiences, the blue circle, okay? This, this would refer to the set of events that we've experienced. By the way, I have to clarify that we're not talking about personal experiences, no? So just because I haven't experienced, for example, depression, no, I've experienced depression. Uh, if I haven't experienced something, it doesn't mean it's, it doesn't belong to the empirical domain, no? As long as humanity has experienced it. For example, the Holocaust. I haven't experienced it personally, but it has been experienced by humanity. So that's part of the empirical domain, no? But there are, if there, there is the wider circle, the white, circle, which refer to unperceived or unperceivable events, no? um, which is the domain of the actual. No? So events may be experienced, and when they're experienced, they belong to the blue circle, but if they're not experienced, they belong to the outer white or gray circle. Okay, So the world is stratified at least uh, in this way, that there are events beyond our experiences. No? But uh, this is only a sketch of the world, the stratification of the world. This is not yet a complete picture of the stratified world. Because when, when Bhaskar analyzes experimental activity, he shows that there is a third domain. No? And I'm going to go into that now. So experimental activity. No? So according to uh, Bhaskar, if you analyze experimental activity, we should also try to look for the conditions for the possibility and intelligibility of experimental activity. What makes it possible? What makes what allows it to make sense? No? So we can make uh, claims about reality or the world. No? And he sort of analyzes experimental activity as made of two components. The first is experimental production. The second he calls experimental control. So let me focus first on experimental production to complete his picture of the stratified world. And then I'll talk about experimental control to get into the third insight, okay? So we're still on the second insight. Um, so according to Roy, uh, causality is discovered, or not just Roy, but everyone, causality is discovered by a regular sequence of events. So you have event A, it leads to event X. Whenever that happens, if it's regular, there must, there might be, it's a, there might be a causal law. There's a possible causal law. No? So, so what happens in an experiment is that you, the scientist tries to create uh, a sequence of events no? to be able to you know, study the causal law, right? But just by thinking about that, immediately uh, Roy says, there's something going on here. No? Um, the, cost, the regular sequence of events that the scientists are trying to produce in the laboratory cannot itself be the causal law. It doesn't make sense. No? Why? If it, were not, if it were not the case, scientists would already know the very causal laws that they're, they're seeking to discover in creating the regular sequence of events. There's nothing to discover if they know already the sequence of events. So the causal law must be something else, must be something distinctive. No? So, um, so he says there must be a third domain of reality, the red circle, which he calls the domain of the real. And this is where he puts the causes, the causal powers. No? So there must be a distinction between the causal laws that scientists are trying to discover and the pattern of events that they create in their experiments. Right? Um, maybe some examples might be helpful. No? But first of all, this is really a critique of Hume's uh, definition of causality as a constant conjunction of events. So for someone like Hume and many others that followed him, the, the prevalent um, mindset in empirical realism is that event A is the cause and event X is the effect. And Roy Baskar sort of critiques that. No? So, um, so here's a very elementary example. When I was in grade school, this was the science experiment we were doing. So uh, if you add salt to water, water will boil at a higher degree, right? 
Now, that's not the causal law. That's just a sequence of events. No? You, don't very, you don't sound very scientific when you say the reason why water boils at a higher degree is that you added salt to the water. That's not, that's not the, the, the explanation. The causal law will have to do, about, will have to do with the water molecules, the properties of the water molecules. No? So there's a need for more energy for water molecules to overcome the surrounding vapor pressure to transition to gas. That's why when you add salt to water, you need a higher degree. Mm -hmm. So the cost belongs to the domain of the real. No? So, um, so what's important here is a distinction between causes and conditions. No? So event A used to be considered the cause, but now what critical realism is saying is that event A is not the cause. The cause is what's underlying the molecular properties of water. Adding salt to water is the condition. No? It's the condition that, that, that activates the cause so that you end up with the effect, okay? So he's really making the usual distinction between causation and correlation. So to mistake event A as the cause is really mistaking correlation for causation. The job of the scientist is to try to um, hypothesize what the cause might be and to verify that along the way. No? So, um, so in, uh, maybe this might be helpful if we have the three uh, circles. No? So sometimes people think that the domain of the real uh, the, the domain of the uh, the empirical domain does not belong to the domain of the real, no. But this diagram shows that all of them are part of the domain of the real, no. But there are certain portions of the domain of the real that do not belong to the actual, that do not belong to the empirical. So one way of summarizing it is, what is empirical and actual are also real, right? So our our, our experiences are real. Events that we haven't experienced, the black hole, that's real, no. What is actual is not necessarily empirical. There are events which may not have been experienced or will not be experienced. And what is real is not necessarily actual or empirical. No? So there are causes that have not yielded any outcome, no event, because it's not been activated. But just because there's no outcome, whether experienced or not, doesn't mean the cause does not exist, right? So it, it's a very, so critical realism is a very, the horizon for reality of critical realism is very expansive. It's very big. It's, it's always open to possibilities. No? And that's what science is all about, right? Um, this whole thing about the black hole, it was an anomaly in Einstein's calculations, right? But if people dismiss that, then we would never find, be able to actually verify the existence of the black hole. So we have to be open to the possibility of reality, basically. That's my takeaway from this. No? So if we conflate all three, that's really positivism. If you reduce the domain of the real and the domain of the actual beyond our experiences to only our experiences, that's positivism. No? And that's the critique that uh, critical realism makes about positivism, that if you're a positivist, you're reducing reality only to your experience. And that's an impoverished sense of reality. No? Okay, so uh, I, I, I've always found this interesting. Uh, I think this was in his first book. Um, uh, Roy sort of asks, uh, what is your criterion for reality? And most people will say perceptual. To see is to believe. If you're not just to see, but to hear, to taste, everything. So if you're able to experience it, it's real. No? But what critical realism does with, this, with the concept of stratification is that it uses a superior criterion for reality, which is the causal criterion of reality. No? Which means that even if you can't perceive something, as long as it is causally efficacious, like black hole, as long as it can have an effect, even if there's no effect yet, as long as it can make a difference, even if there's no difference yet, it might be real. So it's a, it's a more, uh, how do you say, expanded horizon for reality. No? So that's the critique of uh, uh, critical realism on positivism by, through the concept of stratification. Are we doing okay? Am I going too fast? Okay, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so in summary, the three domains of reality are the three domains, the empirical, the actual, the real, no? and this is the concept of depth, depth, strat uh, depth stratification of critical realism. Um, so the, the second conclusion is that experimental activity would make sense only if the causal laws were distinct from the sequence of events that we are producing in the laboratory. In short, causes must belong to a non-empirical domain, must belong to the domain of the real. No? It's not the condition, it's the cause, okay? So yeah, before I go to the, th uh, third, um, the third insight where he talks about our experience of flux and, and chance in the world, I just wanna say that I, I, I 
I find that very, I find the concept of stratification really powerful because it's, it, it kind of makes you question yourself whether there is something else you're, you're sort of dismissing or neglecting. And as a scientist and as a social researchers, that's a question we need to always ask ourselves, right? So it, we always have to be on the lookout for something else. No? So for the third insight, what Roy does is he focuses on our experience of flux and chance in the world. Now the world's in flux, there's always chance and coincidences. No? And basically he focus, um, he says that it is through experimental production and control that causal laws become empirically accessible. So we learn about causes through experimental production and control, but he is focusing now on experimental control. As we know from experiments, no, um, we need to control the variables in an experiment. No? So for the empirical and experimental sciences, passive observation without intervention is not enough. No? If we just went out to the world and waited and observed, we won't know as much as we do in science as we do today. Experiment intervention is important. It's important to exercise experimental control, no? which is what we do in the laboratory. No? So um, the regular sequence of events can only be created in the laboratory if variables or factors that can intervene outside in the world are controlled in the laboratory and isolated in the experiment. So let's say I want to study the relationship between event A and event X. No? For it to happen in the lab, I, I could go out in the world and wait for it to actually happen, but it'll take forever because of all the things going on, right? But, um, but what happens in the laboratory is that uh, there might be other events that might lead to another event, no? But what you do is you control event B and C, the other conditions, so that you end up only with that particular sequence event you want to study. I think that's quite, quite obvious and simple. So the conclusion he makes here, the third insight about the world, is that the world must be an open system. And what does he mean by that? This means that in the world um, exists and interact different causes uh, that co-determine events. So in the world outside the laboratory, whether you like it or not, there are different causes that interact with one another that affect outcomes. No? Sometimes outcomes are canceled out because the, event, the causes sort of interact and cancel out one another. So the possibility, so uh, the, the, there's a possibility of causes not yielding actual in outcomes even when they have been triggered. No? So this is important because just because there's no effect doesn't mean there's no cause it's possible that other causes have gotten in the way and have intervened. Again, as social scientists, this is an important uh, thing to watch out for because sometimes we kind of jump into conclusion that there's no outcome, so there's no cause, but you know, uh, there's an open system, right? So to illustrate it further, in the laboratory, we have a closed system. You make sure that the system is closed so that event one will lead to event two because of the cause. No? So there's no extraneous variable. But what happens in the world outside? What happens in the world outside? We don't control, we don't exercise that control. No? In the open system, uh, if there were no other causes, event one would uh, yield to event two, but there are usually more than one, there's more than one cause. No? And what happens is that the interaction of causes one, two, and three, um, they, they interact with one another, they lead to another event, to event three, not to event two. Okay, so that's, that's an important insight about the world. It's an open system. Actually talking about it now, it's almost like, it's kind of obvious, right? But actually it, it clarified a lot of things for me as I was uh, going through uh, my study. So it is possible that a cause has been activated by the right conditions, but remains unactualized. In short, it does not lead to an outcome because of other causes interacting with it. So uh, I, th I think this is a very important guideline for us social researchers. Um, Okay, so in a sense, what, what uh, critical realism does with the third insight, it, it, it redefines causation. You know? Whereas before, uh, David Hume, uh, the positivist and successionist view of uh, causation is really correlation, you know? because event A is cause and event X is effect. You know? But the critical realist view is that um, the cause belongs to another domain, to a non-empirical domain, and also there are other causes that interact with that cause that may lead to another event. Okay, so so it's it's a um, it's a redefinition of causes. Um, so causation is not constant conjunction of events. It's not event regularities. It's not empirical determination. It's not necessary correlation, but it's necessity without determination. That's a very dense phrase that I find very helpful personally. I'm not sure if Roy himself used this, but it, it's a very helpful phrase 
when I think about causation in the critical realist sense. No? It's necessity without determination. It means causal laws are about tendencies of acting in the open system, which may or may not be realized in any sort of outcome. No? I'll give an example. So um, a lot of studies have shown that uh, one of the factors that lead to the, one of the causes of depression is biochemical. It's possible that there's something in the brain that gives you a predisposition to depression. But just because you have that cause in your brain doesn't mean you're going to get depressed. No? It's very possible that other causes may actually uh, interact with that cause and may lead to something else. So just because you have the cause doesn't mean it's going to lead to that particular, to the expected effect. Okay? And in fact, the challenge for us is to study the interaction of the to explain a phenomenon, our challenge is to study the interaction of the different relevant causes that lead to the phenomenon. And that's really very difficult, actually. That's quite challenging. So I like, I like this quote a lot from Anscombe, uh, which talks about the same thing. Outside the domain of closure in the open system, laws are like the rules of chess. The play is seldom determined, but no one breaks the law. At least no one is supposed to break the law. No? So for example, gravity. Um, it doesn't mean we're all going to fall all the time, right? But no one can defy the law unless another cause is uh, in effect, like a plane or something, you know, an airplane engine or something, right? So causes do not determine events. They, they are only tendencies of things happening. So causal laws define possibilities and limits of acting in the world, but they do not dictate their outcomes. For me, this is a very freeing insight, you know, that, uh, yeah, because... Somehow, for some reason, I don't know if it's my, my own education, but for some reason, we kind of have this default deterministic view of the world that just because there are causal laws, we're all victims and we're all going to be puppets no? and you know, whatever. So, so critical realism critiques determinism because causes do not always necessarily yield an effect. It's true that my biology will sort of set the stage for me, but I'm not condemned but to my biology. No? Um, there are other causes that can get in the way, in a good way, right, to, to save me. Okay. So that would be the third insight of uh, critical realism. Okay. Um, experimental activity would not be necessary if the world were a universally closed system. So the world must be an open system. And I think you'll have a field day looking at the implications of this in your own work. Now, if the world's an open system, what does this mean in, in terms of my work, right? Okay. So the fourth insight, the last one, the world's emergent. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, what do we mean by emergence? Uh, again, this is a rather dense definition, so we're gonna unpack it together. So let me read it first. Emergence is the process of constituting a new entity with its own particular characteristics through the interactive combination of other different entities that are necessary to create a new entity, but that do not contain the characteristics present in the new entity. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you understood that. I didn't. I felt, you know, I kind of got lost in, in reading it. But let me unpack it for you. So emergence means a new entity emerges right, with its own set of characteristics different from the more from its basic components. Right? So the basic components have its own set of characteristics. The more complex the new entity requires the basic components, but it's different in a qualitative way. Right? And the best way to do that is to think of examples and I have some very simple examples. No? So the first one's water, right? Hydrogen and oxygen, right? Um, water is nothing like the hydrogen and oxygen separately. No? When hydrogen, when two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen get together, uh, you have something completely different. Water needs hydrogen and oxygen, but it's qualitatively different from hydrogen and oxygen, okay? So water is rooted in, H2O, but it's emergent from and irreducible to hydrogen and oxygen. So you can't say, I want to learn more about water by studying hydrogen and oxygen. That'll help, but it won't be complete. If you want to study water, you have to study water as a phenomenon. You cannot reduce water to hydrogen and oxygen only, and that's it. No? Hydrogen and oxygen can help you understand a little bit of water, but not all of it. Another example, a uh, computer. No? Computer is made of plastic, metal, silicon, electricity. But it's not just a bunch of plastic, metal, and silicon electricity, right? So computer is rooted in plastic, et cetera. But something new has emerged no? and cannot be reduced to merely its ingredients, its components. A lot of power, powerful things are happening and are possible because of the computer, because of the special combination of plastic, metal, 
silicon electricity. I'm not an engineer, so I don't know how they combine it, but it's a special internal relationship. No? Uh, the more relevant example is society, which Dog will talk more about. No? Society, obviously, is rooted in people. Without people, there are no society. There's no society. But you can't just reduce society to the individual persons that belong to that society. No? Something else is going on you know, when you have a society. You know, something has emerged and is irreducible to the individual members of society. You know? uh, and we'll hear more about from Dog later. Okay, so basically, uh, there are different ways of thinking of the hierarchy of causes, but this would be, I think, the four basic ones that people agree on that the most base, the, the most lower order causes are the physical and chemical causes followed by the biological causes, the psychological, and the social. The point here is that in the open system, we don't just have different causes, but we have different types of causes, which differ from one another in terms of complexity. So the biological always requires the physical and chemical, but something else is going on when you have life. You know? When you have consciousness, psychological, you, you need a brain, you need all the physical and chemical components of it, but you can't reduce consciousness to the brain. You know? There are people who do that, uh, but if you're a critical realist, you should think twice before doing that. No? The same with the social, social causes. Okay, so there's a hierarchy of causes, there are different types. You know? uh, the, the, the higher order causes are made of the lower order causes, the more basic ones, no? but each level is real in its own right because each level is costly efficacious in its own right. No? So once you have society, the social causes, it's not just a bunch of individuals doing stuff together. No? Social structures have a causal power of their own, and they are irreducible to psychological causes, biological, physical, and chemical, and they are at, uh, in their own right, they're real in their own right. Okay? So, the higher order causes are not completely determined or explained by the lower causes. To a certain extent, for example, consciousness can be explained by the brain, but only to a certain extent. That cannot be completely determined or explained by, by the brain. No? And while they remain subject to the laws of their nature at the lower level, their properties are distinct and irre irre irreducible. So consciousness is affected by the brain, of course. No? When you have brain damage, you have a problem, right? But their properties are distinct and they are worthy of study in their own right, okay? Um, so each level, of course, is irreducible to the lower levels, no? Each level is causally efficacious in its own right. And as we said, using the causal criterion for reality, uh, each level is real. So social structures are real in their own right. You can't just say, oh, this is a bunch of people doing this or that, no? So poverty is real, not just poor people, okay? Something else is going on in poverty. So, um, so in the open system, we have different types of causes interacting. So for example, if we have physical and chemical causes, event one might lead to event two, but because there are other types of causes, psychological and social causes, it might lead to something else, event three. The example I used previously was uh, depression. You might have the physical, chemical predisposition to depression, but if psychologically, for example, um, um, let's say let's say they're quite determined not to get it, and 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 you have the social uh, support, somehow it doesn't mean that you're going to end up with depression. That's very simplistic. I realize that, but I'm just saying that I'm just trying to demonstrate that the interaction of the different types of causes. That's the focus of our project, really, you know, in our social research. How do they interact? First of all, which are the significant and relevant causes? What types of causes? How do they interact? And that's how hypotheses are born. You know, and, and we, we learn more about uh, co causes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'd like to just mention dual or the concept of dual or multiple control, which is related to this. The higher order causes are not absolutely determined by the more basic causes. Of course, we're determined by the more basic causes, but not absolutely. And I think that's an optimistic view of reality, right? We don't want to be determined by, you know, our, our physical, and, that, and that's it. But the higher causes, the higher order causes are capable of acting back on the lower order causes. They also have causal power over them. For example, there's a, I think it's quite, we all know that when we're hungry, we can't learn, right? It's hard to learn. It's hard to study when we're hungry. 
Um, but it's possible to actually transcend the hunger. No? Uh, it's possible to say, I'm, I'm really famished, but I'm going to exercise my, my willpower and really try to at least get his over with this morning. You know? So we're not absolutely determined by the more basic causes. So again, how do they interact and to what extent? That's the challenge to us uh, researchers. So we can, uh, we can enable or constrain the operations of the physical, biological, and social causes we are subjecting. You know? So we can act back on these lower causes. So natural, biological, and social causes provide us with possibilities and limits, but they do not determine our behavior. We can still, um, one of the, I think, big insights of, um, I think it's already in the possibility of naturalism where, where he talks about reasons as causes, you know, that, that uh, human agency is a cause. You know? And, and um, it's a psychological cause that's, that's, that, that's part of the open system. In fact, this is one diagram, human agency, psychological cause. No? Uh, it's affected clearly by matter, by physical and chemical causes. It's affected by biological causes and social structures. But human agency can also act back no? and, and sort of shape the way these causes can affect uh, the person. No? So, so it's, it's two way. No? It's, it's upward and downward. Causation is not only upward, it's also downward. It's two, it's two way. Okay. And that's, that's great because um, that kind of builds a case for human freedom, that there is such a thing as human freedom, although limited, of course, not absolute. Okay, so the, for, the final conclusion is that in the open system, different types of causes interact to determine uh, events. Um, so an explanation of a phenomenon must account for the interaction of these different types of causes. No? So there's a need for interdisciplinarity. No? Uh, because there are different types of causes. You know? And basically, uh, I think Roy Baskar said, the nature of an object determines its cognitive possibility and defines a science proper to it. So if, if a phenomenon has several causes that can explain it, you need several sciences to study it, right? Um, so uh, that, there's a hierarchy of intransitive causes, but there's also a corresponding hierarchy of transitive sciences. So if you want to study depression, it's important to have psychology, but it's also important to know about social structures and and uh, and some chemistry, you know, and so on and so forth. No? Okay, so really, what critical science, uh, critical realism does also is it, it critiques reductionism. Let's not lapse into material reductionism, which is a very common form of reductionism. It's very tempting because it's very easy. It's very easy to to just reduce everything to the physical, no? but but that's not. I think that's not what we're asked to do. Okay. So let me summarize. There are four essential insights for me in critical realism, in transitivity, which critiques relativism, certification, which critiques positivism, open system, which critiques determinism, and emergence, which sort of debunks reductionism. And having these four concepts helps, helps clear the ground for our discourse and can guide our research. So I think the question to ask for you is how, how will these four make a difference or improve the way you do research, given your field? So um, yeah, basically that's my that's my summary basically. So um, I promised Doug I would take only thirty minutes, but I took almost an hour. So anyway, thank you. Um, okay. Thank you.